Welcome to Mountain Meister. I'm your host, Ben Shank. Today we're going to talk about a variety of things. Our insecurities, death, and even how to make the world a better place. To be honest, I think the world would be a much, much better place if we didn't try so hard to... If we didn't try so hard to... Want to know the answer? Stay tuned. Welcome to Mountain Meister. Who are the Mountain Meisters? Committing to the goal and galvanizing you and your team behind that one single focus. Being at peace with that fear and being okay with it. You gain a real appreciation for your life and for what you have. Learn about their extreme lives on rock, snow, and ice with your host, Ben Shank. Hello, Meister fans. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. Today with me, I have Steve Casimiro. Steve, hi. How's it going? It's going awesome, Ben. How are you today? Things are good. Things are good. And this could be in the middle of the night when we're recording this, or it could be early in the morning because a podcast has no time attached to it. I think it's morning for you, though, isn't it? It is morning. I have a nice big steaming coffee here. The sun is streaming in. It's a gorgeous fall morning here in Southern California. Excellent. Well, for our listeners who may not be aware about Steve, he spent 11 years at Powder Magazine, launched Bike Magazine as founding editor, and contributed to National Geographic Adventure for 11 years, most of those as West Coast editor. And now your baby, Steve, is the Adventure Journal. You founded that. He writes essays. He posts other interesting pieces of writing, posts videos, gear, and just about everything else except, Steve, a podcast. Any thoughts on starting a podcast? (laughs) Sure. As soon as I can clone myself, I would love to dive into podcasting. You can leave the podcasting to me. How about that? That sounds good. (laughs) So the typical mountain meister we have on is doing all sorts of crazy things as a profession, like climbing big mountains or running really long distance. You, You are writing, Steve, about those people, about the places they go. We need to know what sort of recreating do you do in the outdoors? When did you discover your love for this? Um, Well, I've always been an outdoors kid Mm -hmm. from the time I was little, but I wasn't born to, say, the mountains, um, like a lot of people. And in my teens, I really started to see just how uh, wild you could be outside and the kinds of things that you could do. And um, I went on a – I think I was 14 or 15, and I went on a a river trip in West Virginia. I grew up in in Northern Virginia, and uh, so most of my play was uh, on the East Coast. And um, it was uh, it was kind of like a mini hour bound sort of thing, and and spent a week running the New River and and just rock climbing and backpacking and uh, and whitewater canoeing. And I had never done anything like that before, and it just opened my eyes to uh, to the potential. So did the writing come first? Or- the adventure? Uh, actually, the photography came first. I was 12 when I got my first camera. I was way into photography all through school, through junior high school, through high school, college. I actually started stringing for local papers, um, making a little bit of money when I was still in high school. So, so that was really the genesis of it. And then in my late teens, it sort of all com- came together. I mean, I think that's when a lot of people are kind of figuring out who they are, who they want to be, the differences between who they are as, a, say, a high schooler and who they want to be as a young adult. And, and that was true for me, too. Um, I started getting into rock climbing. I bought my first mountain bike in 1982. I started skiing in 1979. These things all came kind of later in life to me than a lot of a lot of folks. You know, I was 18, 19, 20 when I was kind of getting into this stuff and as I was launching my career. And so it all started, these threads all started to come together right around the same time. That's good timing. It was great timing. It was, it was awesome timing. And I was getting a journalism degree and I was working for a newspaper and I was also starting to see outdoor media right about the same time that I discovered skiing. I also discovered Powder Magazine, which was uh, just such a bright light in the ski world at the time, and it still is, but at the time, media was a much, uh, uh, I guess, darker place. There weren't as many titles, and mm-hmm. um, and so it just it stood out, and it had so much 
this incredible energy and vitality, and it wasn't serious. It did it held the world lightly, and um, and I loved that, and I was attracted to that. And within a couple of years, I got this connection at Powder, and within a couple more years, I found myself working there. And so that outdoor media world was very different from the one that I had grown up in. I grew up outside D.C. in the Watergate era as a kid. I watched what happened as Nixon was brought down, and I. I saw the power of the press, and I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to make my mark on the world that way. But at the same time, I was falling in love with this way of living outside that was just incredible, that opened up your mind and your body and your spirit. And so Powder and Outdoor Media became this vehicle for a whole different way of life, a different way of communicating people that was uh, a radical departure from what I had thought I was going to do. Hmm. So you mentioned how things were different, things are different now. Media as a whole has transitioned. You've been a part of two transitions, one from you know, print to, to online, and then also maybe a more recent transition is to shorter, more abbreviated content, and that seems to be the trend as maybe our attention span is getting shorter or whatever it is. Have you had to adjust your writing style to accommodate for that? No. No, I don't think so. Um, funny enough, I started my career at USA Today. And and in 19, I don't know what it was, 85 maybe, we launched an online news service, which, <laughs> I mean, smart. think about that. 1985, uh, you had to get it through CompuServe. And the idea was that you would, you would dial this up and then print out these little news snippets. So even then, I was taking these kind of broader topics and reducing mm-hmm. them to, in a very sort of USA Today style to just a paragraph or so. And I ultimately found it kind of not very satisfying and then went to a smaller paper where I could write longer pieces. Mm-hmm. And so n- now with Adventure Journal, I I think you have to, as a, as a writer, as a photographer, or as a communicator, or whatever label you want to throw at it, you have to think about your audience and you have to think about how they're going to be receiving what it is that you want to communicate, whether it's along with a book or whatever it is. And, and it, there definitely is an adjustment with AJ of, of trying to take stories that I think are are complex and worthy of a uh, longer space, but having to reduce them to say seven hundred words, um, the the medium just doesn't lend itself to that. It doesn't lend itself. The phone doesn't lend itself to necessarily reading long stories. People are on the go. They're reading in the subway. They're reading in the bathroom, wherever it is. And so I think that you just have to try to be smart about that. Some people, and this is what I thought originally, was that you know shorter things are probably easier to write. You don't have to write them. This is obviously from an amateur uh, writer like me. But one quote, which I absolutely love, and you've probably heard of this before, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. That is from Mark Twain. Yeah, it's a wonderful idea. Mm-hmm. It really is. What's, what's been fascinating for me and, and amazing is actually that um, the writing is, is just not hard anymore for mm-hmm. me. And a few years ago, after I left Powder and Bike, my wife watched me kind of moaning and groaning and wailing and all that. And she goes, you know, if you're going to write for a living as a freelancer, maybe you should try to find a way to enjoy it. <laughs> and I went, you know, hey, that's, that's a really good idea. And so I set myself on this path of figuring out like, what is this process? And ultimately what I found after I left uh, really making my living predominantly from working from other people to predominantly working, writing for myself um, was I wasn't trying to please an editor. You know, and so when I sit down to write now, I feel like I'm writing to my friends. And yeah, there's a challenge of getting the right words or, or making sure it's communicating exactly what I want it to say, but I don't feel like I'm trying to please anybody. I'm just trying to communicate things in a way that pleases me. And so very rarely, whether it's short or long, am I stuck for words. This is process- this is incredible, just letting you know to to reach a point where you really don't feel like you have a problem writing this stuff. I don't, I don't know. You're you're not as challenged. I guess you're still challenging yourself, though, right? Well, yeah, it's still a challenge. Mm-hmm. Like, does this communicate what I want it to do? You know, am I falling back on words like stunning and amazing and mind blowing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these shorthand things to get people to click on stuff. Annie Lamott has has written, written this wonderful book called Bird by Bird about the writing process, in which she talks about banshees and drunken monkeys sitting on your shoulder, telling you that your your words are crap. 
And so you don't even write anything because you have this internal voice already telling you that what you're thinking is stupid or banal. And the, the banshees are gone and the monkeys are gone, you know, and, and I just, I'm just writing. I'm writing for people that I love and maybe I haven't met them, but I'm, you know, I have this sense of who these people are. A lot of them are just my friends. And I think that I, I have the luxury of writing about things that I care deeply about and that I live myself and I'm passionate about. And AJ, there's nothing that's contrived about Adventure Journal. There's nothing that is is done for commercial reasons. There's nothing on it that I don't believe in 100%. And so that is a luxury for a lot of writers. And uh, we, you know, you, you get an assignment and in, in you do it. I mean, that's what a reporter does, right? You don't, you're not invested in the story. You're given the story and you go do it. Well, I'm invested so deeply in the world of adventure and, and outdoor recreation that I love this stuff and I can't wait to share it with people. And that is just like a key that's just unlocked the door. That is very special. At the beginning, when you first started this thing, did you feel pressure even from yourself to include things just to make money and survive? Short answer is no. The The more nuanced answer is that I'm always trying to figure out what is the right mix of things for a diverse audience. Um, what are the things that I'm interested in that still fall within the scope of adventure. So it's, I have a lot of interest beyond this world and stuff that maybe I'd like to bring in, but feel like they're not quite there. Um, what's the right balance between stuff that I know is, uh, Viralable, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that that people are going to click on, and and uh, you know one of the things that you and I had talked about sort of before we got on the phone here was was about quality versus quantity, and that's something that I have to think about all the time. Like the the deeper pieces that maybe resonate more spiritually, more with the spirit, I guess, mm-hmm. um, versus the, pe- the pieces that are just, holy cow, you got to see this, you know, and I, 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 they can, they can be one and the same, but they're often not. And so I think that there's, that's kind of the tension. And I found that there's a linear relationship between the number of stories that I do in a day and the number of page views I get. And there's obviously a very direct connection between the number of page views that I have the amount of advertising I can sell because adventure journal is free and it's all based on advertising. And if I don't have a certain critical mass of, of readers, then I'm not going to be able to make a living at it. So I think that's been the struggle more. So should I cover a versus B should I cover gear versus books? Um, it's more, you know, how, what, what is this relationship between the things that I know are going to go viral versus the things that I think, aren't necessarily going to go viral, but matter more. Right. Well, it's hard to explain something that's more meaningful in a viral sense, right? Viral uh, things spread much faster when they're easier to explain because that's what you get those fast clicks on. Oh, dude. I mean, I sit there and I look at some of these essays sometimes and I go, how am I going to write a headline for right, this? Right, exactly. You know, yeah. like Craig Childs, who uh, who is just an amazingly – brilliant man with just an incredible voice, incredible lyricism. He's produced incredible books about the Southwest and about early man and archaeology. And he's a, uh, a regular commentator on NPR. He does amazing work, but his, his, his work does not synthesize <laughs> to a tweet. Right. It, just, it doesn't, you know, and, and I'll, I'll put these stories of his up and, and they won't get anywhere near the number of views that I think that they should get. You know, they make it, you know, 25 or 30 percent of the views of the video of the day. And, and that's fine, you know, because the that might be the the most people might not be reading it, but the right people are reading mm-hmm. it. And so I think that there's just a part of me who cares deeply about the more subtle and nuanced quality of that kind of writing and that kind of thinking. They would like it to get to a broader audience. That's just not the world. It just makes me wonder how many things I haven't discovered out there because they haven't gone viral. Why? Why have I seen, you know, a kid who's high after the dentist, but I haven't seen something maybe a little bit more meaningful than that? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, and, and I don't know. And I think that we, you know, as humans, we are um, genetically built to go after the novel, you know, we're like ravens. We want bright and shiny things. And, and that's, that's just who we are. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. For, for those larger magazines, though, you kind of have validation of when 
something that you write about is going to work. Whereas when you're doing this on your own, you don't necessarily have the people there to say, you know, this is we're we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and, and do this. Do you ever get scared, especially on the more serious pieces where there's maybe some some editorial or opinion going in there? Do you ever get scared that I mean, you have a relationship with your readers. Do you ever get scared that you're going to write about something that isn't going to resonate with them or people will disagree with? No. Not never. at all? No, I don't really care. <laughs> I do care. I care that uh, I, I, I care that I'm not gratuitous, and I care that I'm not flippant, and I care that I don't offend people mindlessly, but I don't care if somebody doesn't agree with me, and I don't care if somebody doesn't get it, because you cannot please everybody. You're not going to entertain everybody. Um, but what if your what if your opinion is just this outlier, and everybody just like, you just happen to be wrong? Can't that happen? Sure, but it hasn't happened yet, mm-hmm. and that doesn't. And I think that if <laughs> wouldn't I be a hypocrite if I said live your life adventurously, but I'm adventurally, but but don't. But I don't run my business that way. Right. Yeah. No, you would be a hypocrite if you said that. So, you know, I try, I take chances with Adventure Journal. Like, if you were to look at the history of Adventure Journal, it's littered with things that I have tried that I, I guess to be reductionist, you could say that they didn't work. I think that a better way of putting it is that they didn't get enough traffic or traction to justify me spending my time on them. You you know, you tried this stuff and you were willing to take risks. I once heard, actually very recently, somebody said, I would rather get three things right out of ten instead of three things right out of three. And his point was that you need to be able to make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. And if you get three things right out of three, you're not learning anything from those things you get right. It's from the things you get wrong that you learn. Yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, there's there's something, like if I had more time or if I had more resources, there are other things that I would be doing. But, you know, Adventure Journal is just me. And I don't have anybody else helping me on the production. I don't have anybody else assigning stories. I have some amazingly wonderful, talented writers and contributors People like Brendan Leonard and Hilary Oliver and Brooke Sutton and Michael Frank and a whole bunch of people who have been tremendously supportive and willing to um, give me uh, some of their best work. Um, but, you know, it all kind of comes through me. And so and, and I, you know, time is finite. And so I, I just have to try to be smart about ultimately what I pull the trigger on and where I spend my time. Mm-hmm. And even the things that don't that I'm not currently doing on a regular basis, whether it's 15 seconds or recommended reading or or Overlandia or historical badass or charting adventure, you know, these, these columns that that people really like people know them and they become a part of the vernacular and they become a part of their way of thinking. And maybe they come back as I get one that I just, I have to do it because it's just too good not to do this. And, it's kind of like they have this this sense of what adventure journal is, even if it's not there at the moment. They know that this is a part of the uh, legacy, as a pretentious word, but I'm not quite sure what the word is. But they they know it's a part of the fabric of AJ, you know, and and maybe it will come back someday. And even if it doesn't, it's a statement about how adventure journal sees the world. We mentioned the monkeys and the banshees before, and that did remind me of something called the imposter syndrome. For our listeners who don't know about the imposter syndrome, you're actually probably familiar with it, um, but I'll give you a quick synopsis from Wikipedia. The imposter syndrome is a psychological phenomenon in which people are unable to internalize their accomplishments. Despite external evidence of their competence, those with the syndrome remain convinced that they are frauds and do not deserve the success that they have achieved. Proof of success is dismissed as luck, timing, or as a result of deceiving others into thinking they are more intelligent and competent than they believe themselves to be. So that's a pretty harsh way to describe it. Uh, I say, you know, like what gives me the Wait, right. Are you, trying, are you suggesting something here, Ben? <laughs> I am not suggesting it at all, but I think it's something I, no, that no, everybody I'm feels. Yeah, I'm kidding. I, I felt it for many years. Mm-hmm. I did, and um, and I don't anymore. Um, and I think part of, partly that's a function of time. 
Um, I also think that partly it's a function of a body of work um, that you can look at. And I think um, also it's a function of the reflection of yourself and the people around you. Um, It's a huge trap to do whatever you're doing, whether it's writing or photography or podcasts or interview whatever it is it's it's you know it's it's obviously it's a trap to do that in hoping to get good feedback and response from other people and yet of course you know we crave that and so i think that this is always going to be the tension throughout whatever you do throughout your life but especially for a creative person or a person whose job is to be creative is finding that where's that internal voice that's that tells you that it's worthy versus you know getting that external feedback you know and if you especially god this is the thing that i've really struggled with this at times with adventure journalism is just listening to the small percentage of people that are throwing rocks at you you know that are just being obnoxious and there what i realize is that there are there are people like that in the world they have an outsized voice on the internet and um and they're going to find you (laughs) and so you, you know you have to put it all into appropriate perspective. I think the hardest thing is to have an accurate assessment of, of who you are and judging your own work. And and I, I, hopefully that comes with time. I, I, I don't know that you're going to have that in your 20s or your 30s. I mean, I think that it's something that, you know, maybe you just need to have a longer stretch of time to have it, that perspective. It's tough, especially in the moment. It's very tough. It's, I mean, you're looking back at it now, but to try to encounter something like the imposter syndrome in the moment when you know that the solution is just give it some time, that's difficult. Yeah. And you know, I want to bring the, bring this back to adventure because I think that, you know, I'm answering a question or thinking about your question in terms of what I do as a communicator, as a writer and a photographer and, and an editor and a publisher. But I think that this is actually a very, um, very important and relevant question for people thinking about themselves as athletes, as adventure athletes, as outdoor folks. And, you know, I, as I mentioned early, I, I didn't start skiing until I was 18. And but six, seven years later, I was working at the country's premier ski magazine, and I was chasing around some of the top big mountain skiers in the world mm-hmm. seven years after I got on skis. And I'm going, what the hell am I, am I doing here? And for most of my time at Powder, I felt like I wasn't worthy as a skier, you know, certainly as a communicator, but not as a skier. And to their credit, that the people who I skied with, who ended up many, many of them becoming very, very good friends, never ever made me feel unworthy. And I just threw myself into following them and learning from them and asking them. But I think that one of the things that the outdoor media has done traditionally, I mean, we we elevate some of these people as heroes, right? And they may be heroes for what they do have accomplished on skis or on a bike or on a surfboard or whatever, but we should not judge ourselves by those standards. In fact, I don't think we should judge ourselves at all. And I think that we do. And I think that most of this is, this is a really key point that I would like to make. Um, Most media, not just outdoor media, but I feel like most media preys on people's insecurities. It tells us that we aren't worthy. And whether it's women's magazines or now with the new men's vanity magazines, they ultimately are telling us that we are not good as we are. And my assumption with Adventure Journal is that you're just fine. Not only are you just fine, but you're pretty awesome because you're living an outdoor life and you're testing yourself. And whether you can lead 5, 6, or 5, 14 or not lead at all, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter whether you're skiing the blues or the greens or the double black diamonds. It doesn't matter. And most media tells you that it does. And most of the outdoor culture tells you that it does. And it tells you, whether overtly or implicitly, it tells you that if you aren't a ripper, that you're not worthy. Mm -hmm. And that drives me crazy. And I struggle with that for many, many, many years. And it's like, okay, I can't ski that, so I'm not as good. Well, who... Who's the arbiter of these things? You know, and I, and I think that that's the through line, hopefully, that comes through with Adventure Journal. And if it's not, it's something that I need to work on. Because I tried to do something with Adventure Journal that I felt had never been done before, which was to bring 
the legitimacy of a hardcore magazine like Powder or Alpinist with the kind of wide-ranging perspective and curiosity of a magazine like National Geographic. You know, and and I felt like it had never been done that you had broader interest outdoor books, but they weren't really credible with the hardcores. And you had the hardcore books, but they were so narrow casting that nobody could access them. And so the common ground of Adventure Journal, hopefully, this is my goal anyway, is that you have an adventurous spirit. And it doesn't matter whether you're a birder, although I don't haven't really covered birding, that's not mm-hmm. my thing, but um or a car camper, or uh, you're doing sick whitewater descents, or you're paddling out and triple overhead surf. It doesn't matter. It's what what, you, what unites all of this stuff is the sentiment that the world is an amazing place, and you like to push yourself. You like to push your mind, and you like to push your body. You like to go new places. You want to be surprised, and you want to explore. To me, those are all values that really need to be celebrated, not whether you can run, you know, 25 miles. Um, yeah, so it's a yeah, it's an exploratory. And, and if you compare on a relative basis, somebody who's stepping up from a green to a blue or somebody who's going from a black to a double black, it's kind of a, a similar a similar feeling, stepping a little bit outside of your comfort zone, exploring something. It doesn't really matter what the level is. Yeah, and I think adventure ultimately is about being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that means like being miserable or, or finding, you know, it's like type two fun, <laughs> category two fun. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's you're cold and you're wet and you're muddy and you're having an awesome time. That's a part of it. And I, this um, this is not saying that I don't like pushing myself really hard and or that I don't like suffering. I do. That's a part of the experience. But um, that that this idea of that we hold up this ruler, I think, is uh, – sort of an old, very binary way of, of looking at things. Well, so here's a question that I've been meaning to ask about the last 10 people I've had on the show, but it just hasn't, hasn't come up, and now it has. What is the difference between, like, how do you identify the difference between stepping outside of your comfort zone and just something that you plain don't like? Because it's called the comfort zone for a reason, right? Because you're uncomfortable, and generally when you're uncomfortable, you're just not, I guess, not happy and then doing something that you don't like. There's a very fine line between those two things. There is a fine line. And I, and I think that you have to be mindful of who you are and what you like and what you want. Um, I mean, that, that's the rub, isn't it? You know, like at, at, at what point do you bail because conditions are just miserable? And at what point do you keep going? And, and I don't know. You know, I mean, that, that really is, a, is such a highly, highly personal thing. And so I, I think that part of it is becoming having an appropriate sense or a confident sense of yourself as a person. What I would say to people who are early in their adventure careers, maybe, is, is just that, you know, hang in there. Because a lot of, because what I found is, you know, I pushed myself through a lot of misery and a lot of suffering and did break through to the other side, got stronger, got fitter, got more knowledge learn how not to suffer quite so much, but also learn to find that joy in suffering. So I don't think that there's an easy answer to it. I really mm-hmm. don't. But I, I do think that the clue to the answer lies in in those kind of the, the deeper values. Mm-hmm. You know, how much do I value fortitude? How much do I value accomplishment? Yeah, no, that's a good point. So, Steve, we normally ask the athletes on this show for a gear recommendation. For you, though, as a writer, I think it would be more appropriate if we asked you for a book or some other piece of writing. Give our listeners a recommended piece of writing. Okay. I have a book. And um, I actually have to call Kevin Fedarko, and I have to apologize to him. I have never apologized to a writer for not reviewing his book yet. <laughs> but Kevin Fedarko, uh, who is just a phenomenal writer, he was on staff at Outside for many years. He wrote a book called The Emerald Mile. And it's actually sitting right here on my desk. I have a review copy that he sent me a good year and a half ago. And, I, you know, AJ, I, I have worked, I've been working so much on AJ for so long. It just has squeezed out so many other things. I sat here and Kevin wrote me this wonderful note and I didn't read his book. 
I didn't read his book. I didn't read his book. And it got all sorts of rave reviews. And then somebody emailed me a couple weeks ago, this kid that I don't know, and he was just saying some nice things about AJ. And he's like, you got to read it, it, Emerald Mile. Just randomly out of the blue, you got to read Emerald Mile. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll read the book. And so I read the book, and I'm going, are you kidding me? Like this, so so the story, so the sub the subhead for this is the epic story of the fastest ride in history through the heart of the Grand Canyon, but that doesn't even begin to do justice what's going on here. I mean, this is a story about people who are obsessive, who are fascinated with the aesthetics of these wooden dories, who have elevated the rapids and the passage through the Grand Canyon into kind of this spiritual and emotional quest. And it brings in environmental issues, these huge issues about the building of the Glen Canyon Dam and and the control of nature and and man wrestling with machine and and the ghost in the machine as it starts to break down because nature ultimately is always bigger than man. It is this incredible story with these threads that as a narrative uh, storyteller that sort of defy belief, like, are you kidding me that this story was just sitting there? And Kevin has so much done it more than justice. I mean, he, he he's brought the, these things together, these story of the Grand Canyon, of the Colorado River and its rapids, of the Glen Canyon Dan and man's attempt to control nature and flooding and one man's obsession with running the river in the fastest time possible. He has done an incredible job with it. This I sounds not- like this sounds like something that will never ever go viral. <laughs> I could not put it down. It, it really, it's gotten some amazing traction, but uh, it actually, I just, uh, I just found out this week, it's on the New York Times bestseller list, which really warms my heart. And and it's, you know, I don't know if it's appropriate for a movie because I don't know if a movie can really do it justice in a in an authentic way. But it really, uh, anyway. Kevin, if you happen to be listening, I'm going to call you this week because <laughs> it, it really is an astounding book. We will put the Emerald Mile on your Meister profile, Steve. Thank you for that recommendation. For the listeners, check that out. Our website, mtnmeister.com. It's under Steve's Meister profile page. Also, Steve, on your Meister profile page is an essay that you very recently wrote called Thoughts on Honoring the Dead and the Living. To use something that we discussed earlier in the interview, this essay was the rare combination of something extraordinarily meaningful that went viral. So I guess I just want you to talk a little bit more about what inspired you to write that piece and why you think it has impacted people the way that it has. You know, I had three folks that I know, some friends, die in two different avalanches on the same day. Um, J.P. Eau Claire, Andreas Franson, and Liz Daly earlier this week. And I wrote a story about, ultimately, I felt like whenever somebody dies, but especially whenever somebody well-known dies doing something adventurous, you know, we have all these post-mortem sort of waves of honoring them. And I think that that's really important. But that's just, you know, I, listen, I was just sort of listening to my, my gut here and I'm going but you know why don't we tell people these things when they're still here because I found myself regretting like I wish I had told JP this I wish I had told I told Andreas this like Andreas was one of my heroes for the way in which he approached skiing in the methodical very considered way in which he approached what people would a lot of people would consider just mindless extremism. He wasn't, but that wasn't his approach at all. And the, the fact that I reached out to him and had him contribute to a venture journal, to me, you know, is a huge endorsement. But I, I, should, I wish I just said, dude, like, I can't tell you how rare I think that your approach is and how valuable and important to articulate that to him, to his face. I was never able to do that, and now it's too late. Why don't we do that? Nobody, I, nobody does that. It's not just you. No, nobody does it. And I, I think it's because um, 
it feels a little weird and it feels kind of uncomfortable because we like our intimacy at arm's length or we like it in the dark. Um, we don't like it same gender. You know how hard it is to tell a guy that you love him? I mean, who, who says that? Like you immediately, like, ooh, like <laughs> you start looking at the subtexts, you know, like what's really going on here? It's fear. Like we have this fear, you know, I, I think that a lot of people have a hard time first off figuring out what they're feeling. My dad never knew what he was feeling. Like he could not put words to it. Some people just don't have that. You know, my wife and I talk a lot as we're looking at our kids. We talk a lot about emotional literacy, you know, and being able to articulate what's going on. You kind of have to articulate it to be able to take action on it. And so I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of fuzzy-minded stuff out there in the world, and the Internet is a confusing place. And, you know, I think that we have all these mixed messages about what does it mean to be a man, what does it mean to be a woman, you know, all these kinds of things. And the media does not help in any way. So there's all this stuff swirling around, and then we come into these interpersonal relationships, and, you know, we we worried about what people think of us. Mm -hmm. well, we're worried about... <laughs> we're worried about coming off as a weirdo, you know? And and so we don't take these chances or we don't even think to take the chances. And yet, in my experience, we make our most profoundly strong connections in those moments of intimacy and more importantly, I think, in the moments of vulnerability. You know, like every time I've opened up about my vulnerability, like, oh, man, I was so scared I almost crapped myself. And somebody else goes, oh, dude, <laughs> I got to tell you about this time. You know, when you when you share your frailties as opposed to your her heroism, that's when people can relate. Who can relate to heroes? Nobody can really relate to heroes. We can be inspired by them. But we don't see ourselves in our daily lives with that. So I, I don't know, you know, I mean, I think that this story, this essay that I wrote already after one day is the most popular story ever on Adventure Journal. Yesterday was AJ's biggest day ever. And I think that the reason for it is that we, we all have, we have this hunger to connect, right? And, and to, to live on, like to feel like that we're, our lives have value after we pass. And I, I think that what I was wrestling with as I wrote it and wanting to tell those things to these people, I think that those are universal. Almost everybody can relate to that. And in the case of this particular story, it, just, it happened to be told through the story of three skiers who died in avalanches. You know, it happened to be told through the prism of adventure. But those those things are things that we all hunger for. So I don't know. I, I wish more people took chances. I wish more of my friends took chances and said good or bad things, you know, and just were more openly honest. I think the world would be a much, much better place if we didn't try so hard to brand ourselves, <laughs> whether in person or on social media. I think if we just allowed ourselves to be who we are, Words and all, I think that I think we'd all be better off. Steve, it has been eye opening to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing and being vulnerable. For our listeners, you can read the Adventure Journal at adventure journal dot com. We will have full highlights of today's episode on our website, mtnmeister dot com. Steve, thank you so much. How about any other plans for the rest of the day? We'll end on a light note. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you for giving me the opportunity to go on ad nauseum. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I got some writing to do. I, I have a little bit of stuff to do for AJ tomorrow, and um, I'm going to go ride that bike. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to that episode with Steve Casimiro of the ever so popular Adventure Journal. If you like what you heard today, there's an easy way to hear more. Check us out on iTunes. Type in MTN Meister in the search bar and click subscribe. Your iPhone will automatically 
update the newest episode in your sleep. If that's not enough Mountain Meister for you, you can also find us on the Facebook or the Instagram or the Twitter. We've got all sorts of fun ways for you to connect with Mountain Meister, more so than just with your ears like you're doing right now. It sounded a little weird. Thanks so much for tuning in.